greeting 6,800 friends. And in fact, it looks like I've got more than 6,800 friends. I have over 25,000 friends, subscribers that is. So thank you very much for that. Uh, it's actually pretty humbling to have that many subscribers, to have that many people just listening to me waffle on about technical subjects. I actually gained about 10,000 subscribers a few months ago when YouTube recommended my video on reverse engineering a chip. And apparently some people thought that I was reverse engineering a potato chip, but it turned out to be a little bit different than that. So anyway, I got a huge bump out of that. So that was kind of interesting. Anyway, I was kind of bragging to a friend of mine about that little 10K bump. Uh, he is a pretty popular YouTuber. And he said, you know what I call that? Monday. Also, you may be looking at the video and thinking, wow, I look a lot less blurry. Uh, and the reason is that I've switched cameras to a new camera instead of the old Logitech camera that I was using, which apparently wasn't very good. So hopefully uh, views of my face will be a little higher resolution than before. Great. Let's continue with part four of building a 6800 processor using NMyGen. Uh, a few comments before we begin. So a person uh, who goes by the repo name of GuzTech on GitHub has created a Spinal HDL version of my code, which is pretty awesome. Spinal HDL is yet another uh, high level HDL, so you can check that out in the link below. Uh, let's see. Another comment is that I think that I've been engaging in some premature optimization. Uh, so remember when I drew out buses in the very first video and I showed how, oh, you can put this on the bus and take this off the bus. Well, it turns out that that was premature optimization. Really what I should be doing and what I will be doing in the future is just writing the Python code as it is and not bothering to optimize for the hardware at this point. Uh, I can optimize for Python. That would just be refactoring and would make sense because it would make the coding go a lot more efficiently and quickly. Uh, but in terms of making things more efficient at the hardware level, well, if I do that, now I'm sort of refactoring two layers at a time and that gets very difficult to reason about. So I'm just going to be sticking with refactoring Python and making that a little more optimal. Obviously not to the point where it's unreadable. I never want to do that. So that's what we'll be doing. So it seems like we have created two instructions, NOP and JUMP extended. Let's go ahead and code up another instruction. All right, so here I have added 8B, uh, rather B8, which is load accumulator A with the contents of the address in the operand. So basically, uh, we start with essentially a copy of jump extended because uh, in extended mode, we're always going to read the next two bytes and use that as the operand. So that's here. Now, the next thing is, of course, we want to go to cycle three um, and we want to set up the address to read the uh, operand. So there's the operand right there and we want to set it up to do a read. So in cycle three, we simply store whatever's on the data lines into the A accumulator, uh, and then we can end the instruction. And for formal verification, we have to register that we've done a read. So that would be the third read in this instruction. So uh, let's do some formal verification and make sure that it works. So I've already written uh, this file, formal underscore LDAA. So there again is B8 for the uh, value. Um, so notice that uh, we don't have our post A equals pre A anymore because of course A is going to change. 
so we are going to check that the PC has incremented by two. We're going to make sure that we've read three addresses. Uh, the first two, again, are the same as before, but the third address needs to be composed of the data that we read from the previous two addresses because that is the address operand. And then finally, we want to make sure that A, after the instruction, is set to whatever was in uh, the third address that we read. So let's go ahead and see if that works. So I'm compiling specifically for the LDAA formal verification, and now I'm going to run formal verification. And you can see that it's taking a little bit longer, three seconds instead of two. Uh, again, this is because we have more logic and more code. Uh, so we can see that we've passed the cover state and we have passed BMC. So that's pretty good. Um, one minor change that I made in verification is, uh, let's see. So one minor change that I made with verification is I changed the cover and the assume in, um, I changed the cover and the assume statements so that instead of looking for just uh, the instruction is the instruction that we're looking for, I want to make sure that we've taken a snapshot. And the reason is that I found uh, in looking at some of the traces uh, from before that uh, the verification engine felt free to just reset the processor over and over. So what actually would happen is it would set up the instruction that it's looking for and then it would do a bunch of resets. And remember that a lot of our registers are resetless, which means that uh, core dot instruction would never change. So I got rid of that. And now uh, we just look at the snapshot taken bit because that basically means that we've taken a snapshot because we just executed the instruction that we're interested in. Okay, so that's a jump extended and load a accumulator extended. Now I still haven't dealt with the flags and I will deal with that later. The other thing that I want to point out is that I have removed some of the buses, especially for the um, increment decrement unit. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can get rid of source 16 as well. I don't need source 16 select anymore. Um, and so I don't need to set this as a default and I don't need to set up the bus either. Now, the reason that I'm going to do this is that I feel that, um, by creating all these buses, I may have, uh, indulged in some premature optimization. So, um, I did find that, uh, it was getting a little more complicated than I thought it would be. So instead, what I'm just going to do is concentrate on the Python part. And then once I've refactored the Python part, then I will go ahead and look at the hardware and see if there are any optimizations that I can do there. Now I'm still gonna keep around um, this uh, source 8.1 and 2 bus and ALU, uh, really because that is just going to go to the ALU. And I will need to code up the ALU at, at some point. So we have uh, jump extended and load A extended. And we will note that the first cycle is pretty much identical. It does the same thing. And a lot of the second cycle is also identical. And of course, the reason that they're identical is because that the modes are the same in the two instructions, extended mode. And again, in extended mode, you always read the first two uh, bytes after the instruction as an operand. So let's go ahead and refactor that. So I've created this uh, mode extended function, which basically just generates the logic for an extended mode instruction, at least partially. So cycle one is basically just a straight copy. Cycle two is just what is common. And notice that I had to put the operand up here instead of down here because I do want to return the operand. Now, I put in a comment here saying that the operand is only valid during cycle two. In addition, uh, remember, 
uh, when I went through cycle one and I stored the data lines into the high byte of temp 16. And I didn't do anything with the low byte of temp 16. Well, here I am actually storing the data lines into the low byte of temp 16. However, remember that temp 16 will only be set at the end of the cycle. So during cycle two, if I really want to access my 16-bit value, that's what this operand is for. So during cycle two, if you want the 16-bit operand, you use operand. And during cycle three, if you want the 16-bit operand, well, it's been stored in temp 16 for you. So how does that work? Uh, let's go to jump extended. So the first thing that I need to do is just call self mode extended. And it returns an operand. So cycle one has already been taken care of. In cycle two, this read has been taken care of. So I don't need that. Um, I do need to state that I want to end the instruction and I don't need the formal verification because that's already taken care of by mode extended. So that's what jump extended turns into. Oh, yes. Uh, and notice that when I end the instruction, I use the operand, which again is valid only during cycle two. Um, now let's look at what load A extended would look like. Okay, so again, because this is an extended mode instruction, I'm just going to call mode extended to generate the logic to do all the extended mode stuff. I don't need cycle one because that's already been taken care of. And in cycle two, let's see. So these three statements have been taken care of, right? Um, yep. Okay, so this is all that's left, um, and I don't need this other registration for the read. So that's it. So during cycle two, aside from the whole extended mode stuff, basically I take the operand and stick it in the address register, set up to do a read on the next cycle, and on the next cycle, take whatever is in the data lines and stick it in self.a. And then I can end the instruction, and I still need this um, registration of what I read at cycle three. So let's just run formal verification to make sure that that still works. And the good thing about formal verification is that if it runs, you can be pretty sure that your code is working properly. Unless of course you screw up formal verification itself, in which case all bets are off. And that's what the cover statement is for, to make sure that you're actually doing the right thing. So we can see that we've gotten passes. Let's take a look at um, the jump instruction as well. Make sure that's still working. Yep, everything still passes. Okay, so that refactoring actually worked. Okay, let's start on the ALU. Now, right now, all I'm gonna be using the ALU for is looking at the uh, register that we're loading and setting uh, the flags V, Z, and N, which are for load. Uh, so the first thing that I wanna do is I do wanna keep source 8.1 and source 8.2, but I think I'm gonna get rid of the destination bus. And again, uh, the reason is that I don't, think it's a great idea at this point to, to do that. Um, in addition, I don't like the fact that I can choose to write any registers that I like, and that may actually conflict with writing registers um, elsewhere. So for example, in the LDAA instruction, I do directly write the A register. Um, right over, uh, where is it? right over here. So if I happen to forget, uh, you know, that I set the destination bus to something, uh, and then I wrote another register, well, you know, which write gets precedence depends on where it appears in the code, which isn't that great uh, and can be very difficult to reason about. So I'm just going to get rid of the destination bus entirely. So I don't need that. Now I still do need 
uh, ALU8 because now that's just going to be the output from the ALU. And speaking about the ALU, I'm going to create a new module called ALU8. So there's going to be two inputs, self.input1 and self.input2. And there's also going to be an output. Now, in addition, we're going to need to know the function that the ALU should do. So I'm going to create an enumerated value called ALU8func. And I'm going to have the usual none equals zero to do nothing. Um, and then there's just going to be a load, which is one. And then I can just, you know, add whatever I want after that. So the ALU8 also has to have the function that it's going to do. So that's a, an ALU8 func signal. Now, in addition, there are the flags that the ALU is going to keep around. So self.ccs, that's the way it, 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 it's described in the manual. I think that stands for condition codes. So that's also going to be a signal of eight, technically six because there are only six flags. Um, the top two flags are always um, one. So I do want to set up a reset value. I really would like to set up a reset value and it would be one one because the top two unused flags are always one. Next comes the H flag, next comes the interrupt mask flag, then N, Z, V, C. So um, this will reset the flags to the correct value. Um, the other flags, maybe they should have been resetless, but let's just leave it at that for now. All right, so um, let's write some logic. So for load, basically all I want to do is say with m dot switch self dot func if it's load then all I want to do is say self dot well m dot d.comb. I want to set the output equal to input one. We're going to ignore input two, but also we need to say, um, let me add some, maybe some useful values for the flags. So flags. So I'm going to have H, which is flag number five. four, three, two, one, zero. So there's the I flag, the N flag, the Z flag, the V flag, and the C flag. So now I can just say self.ccs of, let's see, Z for zero equals, uh, and then this is just going to be whether self.input1 is zero. Okay. And for the negative flag, well, that's just if self.input1, if the high bit of self.input1 is set, then it's a negative number. In addition, the overflow flag is reset. Okay, otherwise I basically do nothing and I leave the flags alone, I leave the output alone, don't do anything. Okay, so I think that's correct. Now, if I go back into the core, uh, let me set up the buses now. So basically it would just be so first of all, I do need to set up a submodule. 
So m dot submodules dot alu8 equals alu8 equals um, alu8. Okay, now by default, the alu8 function, and I need now a function signal. I guess I don't need alu right, do I? So this is going to be called alu8 func, and it's a signal of alu8 dot alu8 func. And it's going to give me an error because I don't have that import, right? Well, I thought it would give me an error, but I guess not. Uh, so self dot alu8 func is alu8 func dot none. That's the default. And now alu8 dot alu func. Uh huh. Alu8 dot. Okay. Um. Still doesn't like it. Oh, now it thinks right, because that's a variable. Okay, I'm just gonna call it ALU then. <laughs> Here. Okay, and now I think I do need to import it at some point. So from, how about from ALU8, import ALU8 func and ALU8. That way I don't have to have ALU8 dot anywhere. Where's the other one? Right here and right here. Right, right, okay. Now I can finally set up the uh, connections. So um, m.d.com equals alu dot um, input one is always equal to self dot source eight one. And same thing with input two. And I want to connect ALU eight. That's our output bus to ALU dot output. And self dot, no, um, ALU dot func is self dot ALU eight func. Okay, that should set up the ALU. So now all I have to do is um, set ALU8 func to whatever function I wanna do, set up the inputs and then just read the outputs. Uh, and the ALU is basically combinatorial. Oh, wait, is it? Is it? Hmm. No, okay, so the CCS register needs to be set on phase one. There we go. Okay, so the output is combinatorial, it's just that the flags get set, like all registers do, at the end of phase one. Okay, so now what I can do is I can go into LDAA external, uh, extended, and instead of just directly setting uh, a from data in, what I would do is I would say m.d.combinatorial self.source81 is self d in. And I can set the ALU function to alu8func.load. And then instead of loading A from D in, I load A from ALU 8's output. Okay, and what that does is it sort of has the side effect of setting the flags properly. Now, speaking of setting the flags properly, notice that I haven't formally verified it yet. So I need to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is copy the CCS flags from the ALU. And I'm just going to say these are flags from the ALU. And in the setup for the ALU, I'll just do the copy. C 
So self dot CCS is ALU dot CCS. Okay, now in formal verification, I should pass CCS in. So let's see. For the snapshot, snapshot, I think here I want to also pass in the value. So I'm going to say m.d.phase1 self.preccs equals ccs. Now, do I have preccs? No, not yet. So I'm just going to create pre condition codes and post condition codes. And then in the post snapshot, I should also give the condition codes. And that's post CCS. Okay, so I've set pre CCS and post CCS. Oops, equals CCS. Okay. Great. Now in the core, when I take those snapshots, I need to be sure to pass those values in. So here we go. Okay, so we've got errors because, of course, I need to pass in self CCS, self CCS. Okay, uh, now in the formal verification files, for jump, the flags should not change. For load A, the flags do need to change. Okay, so I've added a few utility functions to verification. So the first one is just called flags. And what this allows me to do is construct flags. Um, prev would be the previous value of flags. And then I can just say, you know, n equals whatever and v equals whatever. And those will be set in the return value. So that's kind of useful. Basically, I want to construct flags such that the flags that I'm not interested in have not changed. But the flags that I am interested in, I can just set the values using keyword arguments. Uh, and then assert flags is basically just going to assert that every flag is as is expected. So, uh, and that's where I call flags. So basically I just say assert flags and then I say what the post flags are and the pre snapshot flags are. And then whichever one of these I set, and I can set any or all, or several or none, uh, those are the flags that will uh, expect to be changed to that value and the other flags are not expected to change. So one assert per flag so that when, <laughs> when if it fails, uh, it tells me what line is failing and I can just say, oh, that's that particular flag. Because otherwise, if I just check post flags against pre flags, it'll just say that that line failed and then I have to figure out which one was the flag that actually failed. So now in uh, load A, all I really need to do is, let's see. I think it would just be self.assert flags. And let's take a look at what I need. I need the module, so M. I need the post flags and the pre flags. So that's data.postccs, data.preccs. And now I just need to set the flags that I need to check for changes. So let's see, the Z flag, of course, needs to change, and that's just going to be equal to um, data dot post A equals zero. The N flag is just data dot post A of seven. And the V flag is always going to be zero. Okay, so I think that should do it. Let's go ahead and run formal verification on LDAA and see what happens. All 
Okay, and great, everything still works. Um, and I think it took slightly longer because now I've got, again, more logic. I've got an ALU, um, which can take various functions. I've got flags. Um, so of course, the checker has to be able to uh, you know, check that regardless of which flag was set, that only the flags that should be changed were changed and all other flags were not changed. So it just takes a little bit longer. Okay, uh, how about we do some other instructions? Uh, also extended instructions, let's see. How about ADC add SBC and sub? So add, add with carry, subtract, and subtract with carry. Those will be interesting. Uh, those are probably one of the more difficult instructions to implement just because of the way that addition and subtraction actually work. So speaking of that, let's take a look. Say you want to add two 8-bit binary numbers. We first separate the digits into the lower four bits, the next three bits, and the high bit. We add the bottom four bits, making a five-bit sum. The fifth bit is the carry into position four. This is the half carry bit and gets stored in the H flag. We then add the next three bits with the half carry, making a four-bit sum. The fourth bit is the carry into position 7. Next, we add the high bits with the position 7 carry, making a 2-bit sum. The second bit is the carry into position 8. This is the carry out and becomes the carry flag. The carry out and the position 7 carry are exclusive ORed together, and this is stored as the V or overflow flag. The N, or negative flag, is simply the high bit of the sum, because in 2's complement arithmetic, negative numbers always have their high bit set. The Z, or zero flag, is set if the result is zero. Add with carry works the same way, except we use the carry flag as the carry in bit. Subtraction is almost the same with a twist. In 2's complement, the negative of a number is the inverse of that number, plus 1. For example, 1 would get inverted to 1111110. Then we would add 1, which makes negative 1 equal to 1111111 in 8 bits 2's complement. To compute a minus b, we add a plus negative b, which is a plus the inverse of b plus 1. Subtract with carry, if carry were 1, additionally subtracts 1. So we can see that to subtract with carry, we add with carry, except the carry in to use is the inverse of the carry in we want. One final twist, after we invert the carry in and the addend, the carry out, after all flags including overflow has been calculated, is also inverted. All right, so the first thing that I did was add all of those functions to the ALU's list of functions that it can do. So as you saw uh, earlier, we've got some intermediate signals that we're going to need. And for add, basically I use uh, this intermediate signal carry in to tell whether I'm actually doing a carry in or not, based on whether we're doing an add or an ADC right over here. Same thing with subtract and subtract with carry. So basically I'm just either selecting zero or the existing carry. All right, uh, so the next thing that I do is I split up the addition into uh, sums. Here's the four bit sum, which is actually a five bit sum. Uh, and then there is the next one and the next one and so on, basically as the animation showed. Um, 
and then we set the flags according to the results. Same thing with subtract. Uh, so the carry-in is the same, except you can see here that we are inverting the carry, and we are also inverting all of the addends right over here. Uh, and we are also inverting the carry out. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that there is no half carry, so we don't actually need um, that middle part of the sum. Uh, so we can just go straight to adding the first seven bits and then adding the last bit. Uh, I don't really know why the half carry is not used uh, for subtraction. The half carry is mainly good for when you are doing binary coded decimal. In other words, when each four bits encodes a number between zero and nine. And in that case, when you do something like nine plus one, you want the result to be 10, uh, one zero, not actually A. So the half carry actually turns out to be important for this. And then there's an, another instruction, which we'll get to uh, further down the road called DAA, which is decimal adjust accumulator. So after you do an addition, you can decimal adjust it so that all the numbers now become binary coded decimal instead of just hexadecimal. And the half carry flag is integral to that. Uh, why that's not the case with subtract, I don't know, uh, but there it is. So that's the code. Now I've also gone ahead and formally verified it. So within the alu8.py function, so within the alu8.py file, um, I have written some formal verifications. And even though it looks like I'm basically copying the code and just formally verifying whether I can copy code, it's actually subtly different. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm creating a sum five, which is a five bit sum, a sum eight, which is uh, the sum of the first seven digits uh, with a carry, and sum nine, which is the sum of the uh, two add ends plus the carry in. So I'm not actually breaking up my addition and doing a sort of ripple uh, addition, but I'm actually doing three different additions. So one addition is uh, adding the first four bits, another addition is adding the first seven bits, and the other addition is adding them all. The next thing that I'm doing is I'm making sure that the output of the ALU is basically the same as the input one plus the input two plus the carry in, truncated to eight bits, because that's really what it should be. So um, the ALU's output is the result of all those rippled additions, while sum nine is the result of just this one single, you know, non-rippled addition. So I am really comparing the results from two different methods. Um, and then of course the half carry, the negative, the carry bit, the zero bit and the overflow bit are all based on those slightly different methods of doing addition. So that's how I do the formal verification of addition. Same thing with the formal verification for subtraction. Um, and what I'm also doing here is I've got an additional assertion because I wanna make sure that when I actually do subtraction, when I take input one minus input two minus the carry in, that is actually equivalent to the twos complement addition method, which is input one plus the inverse of input two plus the inverse of the carry in. So I'm additionally making sure that my whole theory about subtraction being the same as twos complement addition actually works. So let's go ahead and run that. So first we generate the code and then we're just going to formally verify it. Okay, and bounded model checking passed. And well, we didn't have any cover statements, but that passed too because we don't have any cover statements. 
So one of the things that I didn't do is actually check that the flags that I haven't touched haven't changed. So I'm going to add an assert here that ALU underscore CCS I, that's the interrupt flag, is equal to ALU dot CCS of I. In other words, the temporary version of the flags remain equal to what the register is. And I'm going to do the same thing for subtract, but I also want to make sure that the H flag has not changed either. I don't really need to worry about the other flags. These are the, the top two bits in the flags register because those should never be touched. They should always be one, one. And I guess I may as well assert that as well. Um, so this is going to be asserted all the time. So m.d.comb. So I'm going to assert that alu.ccs of, what is it? Six and seven is equal to one, one all the time. Okay, let's run that and just make sure that everything is still working. Compile and verify. Great, it still passes. Okay, that's good, perfect. So now we know that our ALU can add and subtract properly. Now what we're going to do is go back into the core and implement those instructions. So let's go ahead and find add and ADC. Okay, so there's ADC A and ADC B. So this is B plus whatever memory is plus the carry or A plus the memory plus whatever carry. Um, I think we're only gonna do A at this point. And I believe that there's going to be a pattern between when you choose A and when you choose B, and then we can immediately just upgrade or level up all the instructions so that they can handle the B register as well. So in terms of uh, the extended version, okay, so here is the extended opcode for add. It's BB, so let's go ahead and add that. And we can also see that ADC is B9. Now you can see over on the right side of the table that for add and add with carry, the H flag is changed along with the N, Z, V, and C flags. And if we go to subtract, we can see that the H flag is not actually modified. So subtract sub is B0. And subtract with carry is B2. Great. Those are the four instructions that we need to perform. So let's go ahead and define them down, let's see, here. It's probably gonna be similar to LDAA. So let's do add a first. Okay, so we've already done the extended part of loading the operand. Okay, so in cycle two, we of course want to read whatever is in that address. Then in cycle three, what do we want to do? Um, okay, we definitely want to put the data in onto one input of the ALU. We also want to put on the other input the A register. We want to tell the ALU to do an add instruction. 
and we want to store the result of the ALU into A. And remember that the ALU keeps the flags, so that's already taken care of. And then we want to end the instruction. And of course, because we read a bit of data here, we want to make sure that we have indicated for formal verification that we've done that read. All right, let's just copy this over for ADC. All right, and everything is identical except the function that we call. In fact, everything's gonna be identical for sub and SBC as well. So let's just do sub A sub and SBC A SBC. Okay, that should be that. Now, let's go ahead and write the formal verification classes for these instructions. So I'm going to start with uh, formal LDAA, and I'm just going to copy this and call it formal add A. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at add A. Now, what I like to do is I like to look at the table again and look at the bit pattern and type the bit pattern again. That way I'm just not copying and pasting, and I may be copying and pasting a mistake. So. Let's take a look at add A again. Add A is BB. I'm pretty sure that's not B8. In fact, uh, there's this nice website uh, here that has a nice table of all of the opcodes. So we can see that add A is right here. It's eight. Add A is Oh, it's right, add A extended is B, B. So that was correct. So this is B, B, 1011, 1011. Okay, A changes, uh, B does not, X does not, SP does not, and we've not, and we don't write anything. Uh, the post PC is just going to be the pre PC plus two, because it's a, three byte instruction. Wait a minute, that's not right. That's totally not right. Now I got this line wrong, didn't I? Because in fact, after the instruction, uh, the program counter should be three more than the program counter was than at the beginning of the instruction because the instruction is three bytes long. There's the op code and the two bytes of the operand. So I should be looking for this. And in fact, when I run formal verification, it does say that bounded model checking failed. And let's take a look at why. All right, so here are the waveforms. Let's just pull up the clock, the address, and data. Okay, and out of the core, Let's take a look at the instruction register. Okay, so there's our B6, I assume. And let's take a look at the program counter. So our program counter was, at this point, FFFD. And then it went to FFFE, FFFF, and then it did not go to zero. So this is in fact incorrect. So this means that we forgot something. So what I really need to do is in mode extension function, I need to add one to the program counter after I've read the second byte of the operand. Now the question is, will that screw up our jump instruction? Because remember that the jump instruction takes the operand and then puts that into the program counter. So if we're putting PC plus one into the program counter here, and we're putting the operand into the program counter for jump, which one 
takes precedence. Not only this, but we're changing the cycle number to three, but we're also changing the cycle number to zero for jump when we end the instruction. So which one takes precedence? And the answer is that for n mygen, it's the code that's written last that takes precedence. So here is uh, jump extended. Here's where we call mode extended, and here's where we call end instruction. So any code that gets generated by end instruction that conflicts with any code that's written for mode extension will override that code. So let's go ahead and run formal verification and make sure that jump works. And remember that jump should still work because uh, PC plus one doesn't really happen for jump, but it will happen for LDAA. So here, let us run, let's compile for jump and then formally verify. Okay, that looks like it worked. And let's take a look at LDAA and formally verify. And that's working great also. Okay, so for formally verifying the add instruction, uh, I basically copied the formal verification file for LDA. And uh, the check is actually going to use a don't care for bit one in the instruction. And the reason is that this uh, file is actually going to check both add and add with carry. Now, in terms of the actual formal verification, I've basically copied what I did in the ALU's formal verification because, well, I mean, it works, so I may as well just copy that over. The only difference, of course, is that now one of the inputs is not just any input, it's the previous contents of the A register. The other input is whatever was read for the operand. Um, and the output is just going to be the uh, contents of the A register after the instruction. And in terms of the flags, well, we already have our assert flags function, so I can just say that we want the Z, N, V, C, and H flags to be as they are calculated to be. Now, because I'm going to be checking both instructions, uh, I do need to add a few statements here. So for example, with carry is only true if bit one of the instruction is zero. That indicates that it's a carry instruction. And here, uh, if with carry is true, then I assign carry in with whatever was in the carry flag prior to the instruction. Otherwise, I just assign it to zero. So let's see if this actually works. So first we're going to compile with add a. Okay, that compiles. And now let's run the verification. Okay, and it worked. And again, it's taking progressively longer and longer because again, I'm adding more and more logic. And we're going to do the same thing for subtraction. So this is the file formal sub a. Here we go. Oh, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Okay, well, one way of trying to figure out why it doesn't work instead of staring at the code and trying to figure out what I screwed up, let's, uh, let's look at the trace that it came up with. Okay, so as usual, let us look for the clock, the address, and the data in. And let's look at the instruction register. All right, so B0 is the instruction that we're looking at, and B0 is subtract without carry. So let's see what's going on here. There's B0. So the operand is BFFF, and the contents of BFFF is 60. So let's take a look at the A register. There's the A register. 
So the A register was zero, and it looks like the A register changed to six zero, and that is definitely not correct. Okay, we can see that I reverse these operands. <laughs> this should be, we're not doing data in minus A, we're doing A minus data in. Okay, change this as well. Okay, rerunning formal verification for the, what is this, fourth time? Here we go, hoping for a win. All right, it's looking great. Okay. Great, it works. Okay, so now that I've got all of these instructions, um, there is a bit of commonality between them. Uh, one of the common bits is basically this, right over here. What I'm doing is during cycle two, I'm setting up the address to read some particular address. Uh, I'm setting up read write signal to be one, which means read. And on the very next cycle, I'm using the data in. Um, and in addition, I'm registering that I've done a read. Um, data in uh, for load A seems to go into source 81. For add A, it goes into source 81, although it doesn't really need to uh, because, of course, D in plus A is the same as A plus D in. Uh, for sub A, it's just going into source A2. Now, maybe what I can do is write a simple function called, I don't know, read byte. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it like that, and I'm going to copy this part of the instruction along with this part of the instruction. Okay, now I have to think about how I might use this read byte. Well, first of all, the uh, address is always going to change, so I need to say, what is the address? Okay, so there's that. Uh, the next thing is that the destination may always change. So let me say combinatorial destination is going to be some signal. Combinatorial destination, because I want to make absolutely clear that this is going to be combinatorial. In other words, if I wanted to take, if I wanted to read DN and then store it somewhere using phase one, then I couldn't actually use this at, at this point. Uh, let's see, the verification remains the same. Now, the only other thing is the cycle to do this on. Now, I suppose that I may want to read a byte starting at cycle three, or maybe starting at cycle four or five or whatever. So maybe it would be a good idea to say which cycle this thing should generate code for. So cycle is just going to be an integer, and then this is just going to be cycle, and this is just going to be cycle plus one. Now the interesting thing is that this cycle is an integer. It is a Python integer. It isn't a signal. Uh, it is not a value. It is not an n my gen value. So n my gen, when it encounters this code, will actually put the constant in here and cycle plus one as a constant. So it's not going to have an adder over here. At least I hope it doesn't. Okay, so that's what read byte does. Okay. Now for LDAA, we're simply going to say read byte starting from cycle two. 
the address is the operand, and the destination is self.source81. That means that I can get rid of this section. I can get rid of this line. And I can get rid of that line. Oh, I need the module. OK, so let's uh, formally verify load A again. Because I made a change, it's always a good idea to formally verify to make sure that logically everything is the same. And that looks great. So I think the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use keyword arguments. Because just putting down some integers and some other things doesn't exactly make things clear. How about doing that? OK, that definitely makes things clear. So now I can just do the same thing for add A. So the cycle is 2, the address is still operand, and the combinatorial destination is source 8, 1. So that can go, that can go, and that can go. In fact, just to make things the same as subtraction, I'm going to change the operands around. So now it's A plus the operand rather than the operand plus A. Sure, why not? Okay, we make the same change for add with carry. This is now one. We make the same change for subtract. Okay, things are looking better. The functions are shorter. Let us just uh, formally verify add and subtract to make sure it works. And add works. Let's make sure I didn't make any mistakes for subtract. And subtract works. Excellent. So now we've got five instructions. We've got, well, actually seven instructions. We've got no op, which I still need to formally verify. We've got no op, we've got jump, we've got load A, we've got add and add with carry, and we've got sub and sub with carry. How's that, cat? <laughs>